Disclaimer, this is part 2 of a series looking into Machin X in its entirety. As such, if you're looking to hear more about the history and narrative of the game, it's recommended that you go back and watch the first part. Another thing to note is that this video will contain spoilers, albeit with little to no story context out of something like, hey, this is the boss near the end of the game. It's highly recommended you play the game first and form your own opinion instead of just watching this and regurgitating what I have to say. But I can't stop you if that's what you want. But now, on to the marketing. With the history, narrative, and presentation of Machina X touched upon last time, we just have two more things to discuss today regarding this game. Localization, which I just plain forgot to discuss previously, and the all-important gameplay. As such, today's look at Machina X might seem a lot more simple and straight to the point than previously, but there's still a lot for us to cover here, so let's get the smaller part out of the way before really diving in. Alongside game mechanics, graphics, and hardware changing so drastically throughout the 90s, so too was it how games were introduced into other markets that were also fluctuating wildly. Oftentimes, localizations of this period can involve the changing of names, be it characters, locations, or concepts, censorship of taboo or uncomfortable subjects, reinterpretation of humor based in culture, entire titles of series, removing or adding features, or even adjusting the gameplay in minor to major extents to fit the standards of a particular market. Games such as Earthbound going all in with the changes to the script, Breath of Fire 2's raw as hell translation, the original Persona with the game being changed to a Japanese setting and changing the characters' names to be Japanese overseas, and so much more. Anyways, point is, localization throughout this time got better, but there was still a lot of figuring out to do before we figured out what actually worked. There's a lot that goes into localizing a game, and what exactly is or isn't a good localization might not be fully agreed upon or understood. Because of this, I'll be giving my own thoughts along with some level of objectivity. With that, how do I think Machinex's localization fares? It ranges, sometimes changes just flat out suck, are understandable, confusing yet inoffensive, or positive decision, which is honestly very rare. The game has the usual changes such as censorship, removing and adding features, stuff like that, and especially changing character names, that's a weird one. Kay, as an example, is the same yet her name is spelled differently, instead being spelt with an A and a Y instead of an E and an I. Kadi was changed to Kitty, among many other examples, but most if not all characters got very inoffensive name changes. Other names such as locations and in-game concepts got their names changed, which has very little impact on gameplay, but does perhaps impact the story to some extent, such as Image becoming Sai, Taj Mahal being renamed to Shah Jah's Palace, or the Vatican being renamed to Jean d'Arc Palace. The latter two changes also perhaps being cases of censorship in Machin, but I'll save my thoughts on the locations later. But seeing as I mentioned it a second ago, what about censorship in Machin X? I know a lot of people tend to look down on censorship, and a lot of the time, it really does suck. But in Machin's case, it's either inoffensive, confusing, or completely understandable. The go-to example would be the removal of Nazi symbols in-game. It's still pretty taboo to use Nazi imagery in your media, and a lot of people might be made uncomfortable by it. As such, I don't want to hold too much against the localization team here but I can understand why some people might be upset. Another instance of understandable censorship would have to be with changes made to the boss Shaja. Originally, he had robotic arms meant as an allusion to the god Shiva, but it was replaced with these floaty stabby thingies. Sure, this might have been acceptable to depict in Japan, but in countries as diverse as the United States, it's pretty risky game there. As for the inoffensive and confusing, this ties back into the changes made to the names of the real world locations. I'm pretty sure that utilizing a real world location wouldn't cause much, if any, stir compared to using infamous imagery or alluding to a well known religious figure. But it also doesn't take away from anything, it just leaves me going, why? So the censorship here isn't really worth complaining about if you ask me, and does little to impact the larger meaning of the game. You want to talk about something really worth complaining here? Well, I don't, because it makes me sad, but I have to, since that's my job. In the localization for Machin X, they removed all of the supplemental material. <laughs> that was in the Japanese version of the game. You could read up on biographies of in-game concepts, factions, characters, locations, and it was so cool, but on any other version, you don't get anything. You get jack and shit. Bye. As such, this makes Pet Rock very sad, confused, and crying in his room. 
or as I like to call it, Wednesday. The supplemental material did a lot for Mockin's lore, and in spite of the game being a globe-trotting adventure, just removing it makes the world of the game feel so much smaller than it actually is. I suspect it either had something to do with how Sega localized this game, perhaps thinking it wasn't important enough to translate and just took it out of the final release, or the larger file size is caused by the English language, which my proofreader says might be the case. Lastly, there's this final change that isn't in the Japanese release, which I believe actually improves over it. It's a very minor gameplay change, but it's also a really smart one, one that I think is actually best to hold off on until I actually do introduce the in-game concepts, which I haven't done up until this point, so sorry. With that, I think I've pretty much covered all the notable changes made to the Western release of Machina X, so how would I say it fares overall? Well, it was definitely a solid effort. Changes are mostly inoffensive, sometimes being either an improvement or detriment to the original release. By today's standards, it's most certainly dated, but it's still kind of charming if you ask me. It's more than playable compared to other games localized around the time. It won't blow you away with its quality, but it also won't irritate, you know? Commendable for the time, but far from good nowadays. But enough with the localization. Someone else is bound to make their own 20 minute video going way more in depth than I did. I know most of you are here to see me go on about the gameplay, Mockin's meat and potatoes. Now, if you know Machin for one reason, it's either because of its sick Cosmic Kaneko art, inconsequential censorship that internet funny man find absolutely hilarious for some reason, or its unique first-person slasher gameplay, or FPS for short. For me, it was both the first and especially lasting that really made me gravitate towards Machin X. Once again, the game's an FPS in which you navigate linear yet dangerous levels to secure an escape, choose between multiple forks in the road to potentially impact the story, deal with horde after horde of unique enemies that encroach on your progress, discover beneficial secrets along the way, find extra levels, put an end to multiple bosses, and continuously make yourself more capable of dealing with the opposition that comes your way. Another aspect that makes Machin distinctive is that it's one of the few games that fits into that uber-specific subgenre of body swap games, or as Machin refers to it, brain jacking. It's a unique feature that allows you to use the particular strengths of both your potential allies or enemies to your advantage, letting you swap between them to access restricted areas and drastically change the story to you see fit. Though having a variety of characters might seem overwhelming, each character works off the same basic controls, allowing for an ease of adjustment, but having moves and stats that are wholly unique and tailored towards them, making who you pick at any given time completely distinct yet familiar through the easy to learn combat controls of basic combos, counter hits, and EX attacks. This makes the mechanic of brainjacking one necessary for performing optimally, and to do this you'll need to be at a certain level of psi to be capable of brainjacking your opponent. To do this, you'll pick up these orbs your enemies drop once defeated, or find them hidden in the level's crevices. But once you pick up enough, you'll be able to level up, granting you access to more powerful and impactful characters to battle the opposition. With that basic gameplay description out of the way, my general sentiment on this game is that it's very arcade-like in its approach to gameplay. It's simple, fast, frantic, and good floor does it front and punishing. As an arcade-esque game, it's also simple yet enjoyable with the variety of characters you have access to, the linear, well-concentrated levels, responsive combat, and how it consistently rewards you for playing. With these many elements, it creates a package with a lot of replay value, something I think will become more apparent as I get more in-depth with the gameplay. If you've seen my Rido video, you know how important I think controls are in video games. They're the first thing you'll experience in a game, shut up. So you want to have the best controls possible, which I think Machin is pretty epic at. You got a basic attack button, which might not sound like a lot, but you can get quite a lot just out of the single button. You can press it once to do a basic swing, a hit it a few more times for a stronger combo attack that wrecks your foes, push it forward on the stick for the attack to do a longer lasting hit, hold the button down for a special EX attack which drains health at the cost of a stronger attack, and a few more actions I'll get into later. But yeah, as is, there are a lot of moves to do off a single button. There's also a jump button that you could use to perform basic platforming, amongst other things. And by also holding the right trigger back, you could activate a strafe to zip around enemies. But if you want more ways of zooming around your enemies, you could also use a lock on to get a more seamless combat experience. Approximate the amount of health your enemy has, 
and allows you to auto safe around them. And even better, you could like do this really cool sidestep move, which is done by holding either left or right on the stick and then jumping to avoid enemy attacks if you're in a tight spot. I love this move, it is cool. Oh, locking on also grants you access to jump over most enemies to hit them from behind for some serious damage. But if you want to play more defensively, you could also block certain enemy attacks by holding back on the control stick when they're trying to hit you. Though this is balanced by not having it work with projectile attacks or really powerful attacks. But if you do manage to guard an enemy attack, you could also counter after guarding for some massive damage. Was being able to guard and counter your enemies not enough for you? Well, you greedy fuck. It's also possible to reflect most enemy projectiles, so yeah. You've got quite a number of movement capabilities at your disposal. I have to really commend the devs for this. Not many people then or now tend to use controllers for FPS games, so having a control setup that's so efficient and fun is actually awesome. Though I'm actually surprised I didn't do anything for the keyboard and mouse peripheral the Dreamcast had. Oh well. Another aspect of the combat I've dabbled upon is Psy Rank. By defeating enemies, you're temporarily able to grab their Psy acting as an EXP of sort for increasing your Psy rank, which is useful for getting better characters and it encourages you to face your foes as previously stated. Controls are simple, which actually works in the favor of the arcade-like approach of Mach X. It's easily understandable, allowing the player to enjoy the game rather swiftly, but it'll take some time before they end up pulling up some Matrix-type shit in Mach combat. Basically, it's easy to pick up and enjoy, but still engaging to play through. You have just enough control options for the combat to be enjoyable, but aren't overwhelmed by the complicated combat system at the start, being able to lock onto enemies also makes the combat very fast paced and gives you just the right amount of approach options like playing defensively, a full frontal assault, or an optimized approach. Enemies are also great at varying up the way you move through the combat which is nice. Having the stronger EX attacks take away health is a great risk versus reward system, requiring the player to think carefully about when to use their specials as well as preventing them from solely relying on them is actually the best change Mach and X made when being brought over to the west. Though it sure as hell does not make up for moving the supplemental lore stuff, that is Still gonna piss me off until the end of the day. With simple yet efficient controls, Mocking's basic combat is able to stand out as one of the game's best features. Easy to pick up and understand, but tricky to truly master. Machin also does a good job of pushing the player to fight enemies due to the Psy rank system by rewarding them for confronting enemies rather than just avoiding them. At the surface level, it's a solid system of combat, and I appreciate it. Another part of the control slash combat, which I have mentioned previously, is brain jacking. In Mach and X, brain jacking allows the player to swap between bodies with an opponent, letting the player use their advantages and disadvantages to their benefit. By reaching certain ranks of Psy in Mach and X, done by absorbing the enemy's Psy, you're able to choose from a greater pool of characters who progressively gets better as the game goes on. And there's a good variety to choose from. Fast but weak fighters, slow but strong fighters, balance types, defensive types, inarguably the best character in the game types. Thing is though, not all encounters are required. The Psy slash EXP mechanic is a great way of incentivizing combat. It rewards players who engage with the game's combat to access stronger characters, but by avoiding encounters, it makes those instances when you're up against a very tank-like foe all the more challenging, giving the speedrunning types a harder challenge for a faster clear time. And for the hell of it, let's just rank all of the Blade Masters characters, things you could all brain jack in the game, except for the the, the one-off characters that you never use. These guys. Ah! D-tier, Shaja, slow and boring. Doll, I never use them, so I don't know. Good all right. C tier. K Sagami forma de normalamente. You can only play as her for a single stage, but she plays well. Beishan, good starting character. She is fast and plays well, but wears out her welcome rather quickly because you either choose between her or Shaja and I don't like using Shaja, so I'm typically sticking with her for a while. Divin, fast and fun. His EX move kind of sucks and he's kind of weak, but I enjoy playing him whenever I can because he's really fast. Kitty, you barely get to play as her, but she's cool in the time you get. I just, once again, wish there was more to play as her as. Yeah, it's all right. B tier, Margaret, she is cool and fast, but her special is eh. Yusuf, I don't know, he's slow but strong. Elise, fast and cool. I love using her attack, especially her EX move, the weird robo ball arm. Hyrus, useful attacks. EX attack is great for taking care of enemies from a distance. Don Regalia, slow but strong, though I actually like using him because his design is rad. I like it. A tier. Ko, you can barely use him. He doesn't get an EX attack, but he is strong as hell and he looks really cool. Ray, super strong and super tanky. And he looks rad. S tier. United States President. Fast, strong, great EX attack, pretty much the best character to brain jack. Case Sagami Forma de Blanco. You should kill yourself. SOSLF in.
Brainjacking and Sire are cool. There aren't too many body swap games, but of the ones we do have, I'd say Machin is one of the more interesting games in that very specific subgenre. But what's a good body swap game without a good selection of bodies to swap between? Yeah, Machin has that well and good. Most of them are cool as hell and fun to use, a very play it your way kind of game, which I like with these types of games. Good job, Machin. Getting into one of my favorite parts of this game, the enemies and bosses. Throughout the many levels in Machin X, you'll be required to fight a large sum of enemies, either to make navigating through levels smoother or just to progress. There's a lot of enemies you'll be fighting time and time again, rounding up to about 20 something. Sounds like a small amount, sure, but when each of them have their own patterns, movesets, designs, and methods of being easily dealt with, you will remember most if all of the enemies this game has to offer. Another aspect that makes the enemies important aside from halting progress is that nearly all enemies drop the aforementioned Orbs of Psy, which, if you want to stand a chance against the later encounters, you'll need to deal with as many enemies as possible. Certain levels slash areas also have unique enemies, such as the previously mentioned enemies in the White House and Brazil with these invisible uh, monkey man creatures. But there are enemies that only appear in specific regions of the game, such as the Nazi enemies only appearing in certain parts of Europe, and so on and so forth. Variety is high with the common foes, but wait, Machin X also has a large sum of bosses to fight, totaling out to 15 unique bosses. Like the levels in the game, not every boss can be fought in a specific story playthrough, and no matter the route, you'll at some point have to fight quite a few bosses and miss some too. They, obviously, tend to be much harder than the regular encounters in the game, and act as a good end stage challenge for the player, and like the enemies, each boss of course has their own unique set of attacks, <laughs> making them all rather distinct and memorable for better or for worse. Going back to the common foes, Machin does basic enemy variety very well, once again having over 20 regular enemies in the game, each of which require a unique approach to defeating them, keeping the player more often than not on their toes. The colorful cast of grunts also creates a greater distinction between the levels in Machin by more often than not having the enemies fit in their locations very well. Placement and abundance of enemies is rarely irritating too, only sometimes I felt like I was dogpiled or ill-equipped to deal with enemy encounters. Overall, placement is rather well done. As for bosses, they also do a good job frequently engaging the player by requiring them to move around, avoid attacks, and take them down rather quickly. Examples of which we'll see soon enough. The encounters start pretty generous with the health packs, but get more and more sparse, creating for more tense bosses as the game goes on. However, the aforementioned lack of checkpoints before bosses is definitely a point of contention. Having to restart an entire level just to try and defeat a boss again is annoying. If I die at the boss, I think I should be able to restart there again. Of course, as any game goes, it gets easier the more you play, but it puts off for assigned players and god knows something I and my friends struggled with over the first playthroughs. A bit of a smaller note, but I really like how the bosses are also a showcase of the kinds of abilities you'll be able to use once you brainjack them after beating them. It's cool, and gives the player an idea of something what to expect. Bit of a nitpick though, I would have greatly appreciated some more unique final boss encounters at the end of the game. Having only two is kinda lame, especially for a game with such good variety of enemies and bosses to fight. With that though, I think it's time we do... I might as well do this, with my praises being more than positive on the enemy and boss design, I find it reasonable to give my quick thoughts on the enemies and bosses, ranking from worst to best, based on how much fun they're to fight and their challenge. To make sure I don't spend too long on the small fry, let's split them into groups of three. Worst of the worst, mid of the mid, and best of the best. What were they thinking? The worst enemies in Machin often do not appear, but what little spotlight they get can be absolutely infuriating. These two, for example, they're either impossible to kill or avoid. Can't kill the flamethrowers without using a special attack, and they also have a huge reach. The dive bombers are impossible to kill, and they're often put in spots that are impossible to avoid, like, excuse me? Shitty ROM hack tier level design here, but thankfully it's all uphill. Hmm. Mid of the mid. The most mediocre enemies in Machin X are the ones that are really there to complement the level design rather than be challenges in and of themselves. So I can't be too hard on them, but I'll still be hard on them because... Like the Dragon Grunts, basic introductory enemies, but they're put all throughout the game, meant to give you something to worry about when you're in the heat of the moment. Or these bugs that you have to take care of one by one down this elevator before they overwhelm you. They're not hard enemies, but in the scenarios they're in, makes them more interesting as level gimmicks rather than enemies. Still, pretty cool. Cause I like you a lot. The best enemies that Machin has to offer are the ones that really put your moveset to the test. Unlike the mid-tier enemies of the game, these guys are challenges in their own ways, while being able to complement the level design too, such as the USA robots. 
They're all over the White House level and their placement in situations such as this allows them to act as a good obstacle to get past. But when you get towards them, you'll eventually have a challenge with the enemies testing your skills. It's two for the price of one. Another instance of this would have to go to the Zipper Spider-Man guys. They're both well equipped in both short and long range scenarios. They hit hard, so don't be too reckless around them. But thanks to their versatility, just like the USA robots, they're able to fit into two roles. One where they assault you from afar trying to get somewhere, and second where you get close and have to deal with them rather quickly. It's cool. Anyways, here's my tier list for the enemies, and now on to the boss rankings. Kill! F tier. Ray. Annoying, stupid, ugly, cringe, everything bad. Fighting Ray himself can be fun, but the fact he summons enemies that take a while to defeat prolongs the fight to an annoying extent. Oh, also, when he does this, he proceeds to shoot projectiles at you like it wasn't annoying enough. No other boss does this, so why here? It honestly would have been a fine, pretty good boss without the padding, but it just makes the fight so irritating. Worst boss in the game. Get all right. Going all the way up to C tier, Devin. Way too slow, and the fight itself can go rather quickly, but Devin's slow movement is rather upsetting. Not helping this is the spacious arena giving the player a ton of space to dodge him. Margaret. Cool first phase, but the second phase kind of shits the bed for me. Only a little, though. I think shrinking the arena size would have made it cooler because at some point it turns into a game of cat and mouse. It can be fun, but damn, trying to find Margaret stinks at a certain point. Co. Not really a boss fight and barely puts up a challenge, but hey, that's the point. I don't even know if I should have put it on here, but shut up. Elise. Slow and doesn't hit the hardest. Also kind of disappointing. I think the pieces for a cool fight is there, but maybe her damage and speed could have been bumped a little. B tier, Tyrus. Pretty much a least, but better if you ask me. Much faster and can catch you off guard quite easily. Fun fight, but I think the large arena gives the player a little too much space to dance around his attacks. Shaja, a simple but effective early game boss that requires you to be aware of your surroundings and the enemy. I just wish it weren't so easy to cheese with the EX attacks, but whatever. Doll. Cool fight, but I think there could have been more elements to Doll's attacks that make him more of a threat and enjoyable boss to fight. Kitty. Attacks rather quickly and has one hell of a reach. And she could also dart around the arena like a tiger. Also, I like how the arena is on the boat you meet her at after reaching Lisbon. I just think she could have put up a little more of a fight in the end, but still a pretty solid boss, and I'm starting to realize how much I say could have put up a little more of a fight in the end. I like it. A tier. Geist. First phase is cool and a great battle to end off the more one-on-one -on -one encounters. However, the part with the projectile sucks and it's so hard to gauge when you're supposed to hit them. But the final phase is rad and is a great challenge with the dodging and weaving through his moves before he opens his weak spot. Mr. Lee. Rad final boss for the Hawkeye route, much less of a spectacle than Geist, but still a great fist-to-fist -fist fight, which I really do like. My biggest issue is the lack of a second phase, given, you know, that's just how most games do things, but what's there is cool. Yusuf, a fun frantic boss fight, such a variety of attacks to keep things interesting, though I feel like I'll get unfairly hit when he whips out these organs later on in the fight. So, cool. Andre, a great first boss. Not too easy or too hard, and teaches you the benefits of movement. Kinda sucks how you could finish him off with just two charged sword swipes from the back, but I guess that's just one of those player learning how to play the game kind of thing. S tier. Don Regalia. A great fight. Another one of the fights that asks the player to consider their surroundings. You want to stay on the platform, but you also want to be able to do some damage. It's a balancing act, and if you're good enough, you can even avoid being hit off Don Regalia's platform the whole fight. And that's just what makes this boss fight so much fun. And my personal favorite, the United States President. In spite of what I say about his character, Hockey Brown is the best boss in Machin. An awesome two-phase fight that not only applies what you've learned from the enemies of the stage, but also provides you with an awesome hand-to-hand -hand encounter that once again requires you to consider your enemy and environment. You don't want to be too close to the electricity, but you also don't want to be too far from it so you can't hit Hockey Brown. It also allows players who are good and experienced with his movements to get extra hits on him after his attack. The window is very tight, but damn, it feels so good to hit him. The variety in both enemies and bosses is one of Machin's greatest strengths. Looking back, I'm actually shocked at how few yet unique enemies this game has to face, and, and it really does add a lot to the game by asking the players to consistently engage with the combat in a new and fun way. And the same applies to the bosses. I'd say there's only one bad boss fight in Machin. <laughs> However, the rest range from good to awesome. Good enemy design can go a long way, and Machin showcases that damn well.
Ending off with one of the more low-key aspects of the game is Machinax's levels and how they're designed. Machin boasts around 20-ish action-packed levels with a good degree of them being optional to some extent, either due to forks in the road or your choices in levels. Levels are linear, sometimes the player might have to explore to find secrets, but it's in a very focused environment. It's a simple but effective point A to point B action. Also helping this is how each level in Machin X has a distinctive visual style and set of mechanics to set itself apart from one another. Very rarely do I ever see the same visual slash mechanical asset, other than enemies, used in other levels. The typical Machin level is go goes like this. A ton of enemies in your path, some power-ups, a boss, and sometimes a new character to brain jack. The last two aspects contributing to the little exploration you'll do in Machin. There's not much of it, but if you want to find more characters, fight bosses, and get certain endings, you'll need to find these secret areas. The levels in Machin X tend to mix combat with level-specific gimmicks rather well, with only the occasional shitting of the bed. Some of the best levels in the game are Hong Kong, Athens, the White House, Istanbul, Leon, and the Oil Palace due to how they provide a good sense of challenge through combat, while also developing fun level mechanics. The White House level, for example, bases its whole level off of these huge robots. They're tough, they hit hard, and have long range coverage. This makes fighting them rather thrilling, but it also makes navigating the level safely very tense. It does a great job of consistently keeping me moving, and I appreciate that. Good job, Machin. As for the bad levels, I'd say India, and to some extent Lisbon. Their level gimmicks are either boring or straight up bleh, not doing anything to make the levels fun. India. This level sucks, as it's mostly just navigating these really slow enemies and the switches, and I do mean slow, and given the level gimmick, you'll barely get to fight any enemies. Worst level in the game, but the boss is pretty cool at least. In between good and bad level mechanics, we just have ones that don't really have any gimmicks to stand out, which is fine, I think. Sometimes pure combat and basic platforming is alright if the combat encounters are smart, such as the first level, Moscow, and Sicily. They don't do too much to stand out because of their effective enemy placement, but they're still rather enjoyable levels. Both levels tend to stay under the 10 minute mark, dying in one always sends you back to the start. However, levels aren't long enough for this to get annoying. Sometimes. Certain levels can feel like they go on forever, especially given how you might continuously die. At least having a boss checkpoint would be nice, but no, you get none. But seeing as dying in a level as opposed to dying against a boss is completely different. If I die in the level, then I should redo the level, but if I die in a boss, I should be able to redo the boss. At least that's what I think. It's a very tricky thing to sort of quantify. I would definitely say this is one of those subjective things. I just think the bosses and levels are completely separate things. Later in the game when levels start feeling long, you might feel the need to just avoid every enemy to get back to where you were, and in some cases you can't speed up the process of getting through levels. The White House with its elevator section, and India with its everything being the most egregious of examples. The White House is still a good level though, it's just that one section. Basically, I don't mind redoing whole levels if they're short, and don't have me standing around for crates to move. Although you might be dying quite a lot, health items aren't sparse. Level designers ended up creating quite a good balance in that department. However, other power-ups don't feel frequent enough, or should I say, power-up. There's only one power-up in the game, and it's THE Machin X. It's very sparse, and not in every level, so... It's like, kinda confusing, but it also isn't really much of a detriment, other than, you know, just being underutilized, which is kind of upsetting. Finding secrets in levels is also something that ranges. Sometimes it makes sense, and other times it just... What the hell? Athens, for example, it's pretty cool. Makes you think outside of the box, just a little. When you're exploring the level, you get this cutscene where you see Elise, this lady, find some columns. Later on while you're exploring, you come across a pit that you have to jump across. Now at this point, you've already come across a pit you had to jump over, so by instinct, you just jump over it. But if you take a moment to look down, you'll see a few columns, so you decide to take the risk and oh, you're in a secret area. I like this moment, it requires a little out of the box thinking, and it just makes me happy. Also, they do a good job hinting at it, so that's nice. However, the worst case of this happening is in Amsterdam. You might notice this area is closed off. So you decide to explore around the little, see what's up, but nothing really seems to be doing the trick. But earlier in the level, you end up having to throw a switch to open a door, which also blocks a bunch of water from getting into the room. The solution to getting to the hidden area is to actually throw the switch again, which, all right, maybe I'm a little stupid, but when I see a switch open a door, I think, hmm, if I turn the switch off, the door will close again, so that can't be it, and yeah, it is. I don't know, but this is just weird, weird, weird. I think there could have been a better way to do this, but hey, I can't think of anything right now. Come back to me later when I'm 
Though not every level has exploration, with levels like the White House and Kanzawa Research Institute being good examples. So all levels that lack in exploration due to their, you know, good challenge and design. Exploration in Makin most of the time is alright. Not horrible, but not the best in gaming either. And it really doesn't hinder the game so much since, once again, it's not the focus. But it is still worth evaluating. Level design is decent, it never gets noticeably frustrating, but it never gets too interesting either, like it's barely scratching the surface of what it can do with its level design. Level pacing is also rather swell. In spite of the lack of checkpoints, a run through of a level shouldn't take too long to complete, you'll just be trying a ton of times. Power ups are very underwhelming, there isn't enough variety or impact to consider them worthwhile, and I would have liked to see more. Power ups can do a lot to enrich a game. And last, exploration could also be a little better. Once again, not good or bad, but it can be interesting from time to time. So yeah, the overall verdict on Machin, I think it's pretty strong. I think the level design itself could be a little more interesting in some cases, but when it's strong, it's strong. The enemies are one of the best parts in the game, both the regular grunts and bosses. They offer fun challenges and end up being very memorable. The controls in combat are amazing, easy to learn, and kick total ass. Overall, my opinion on Machin X's gameplay is that it's very well put together. It's a little rough in terms of some of its aspects, but its heart is in the right place and what works, works. It's fun as hell to just put Machin on for an hour and just play it. It's not a very long game and the time I have been playing it, it's very fun. I love Machin and I'm sure that it's just one self-contained game that has literally no re-releases or supplemental material whatsoever. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Isn't there another game I should be talking about right now? Well, you're right, and no way in hell am I not going to be talking about the re-release of Machin X, Machin Shao. Thing is, I have a lot of stuff to talk about regarding this particular iteration of the game, which would be more than enough to fill up its own video, and god, I really do have to say quite a lot about this shoddy release. 